hope that you have enjoyed the music of Tony Redhouse as much as I have. Let's, let's give him a hand. He has been wonderful. So Tony Redhouse, my brother Tony is Navajo. He is a five-time, five-time Native American Music Awards recording artist. He's also a celebrated hoop dancer. And if you didn't get enough of his music and positive energy this morning, you can catch some more of it because he recently did a concert in Santa Fe that has been recorded and will be played, will be aired on PBS on March 3rd and 4th in the evening. So you can check to get the exact time of that. And so that will be wonderful. Tony, thank you, my friend. Thank you so much, my brother. He has perfectly set the tone for today's presentation. And now I would like to introduce you to Miguel Flores. Miguel is a licensed independent substance abuse counselor, a member of the Pasquayaki tribe and the Tohono O'odham Nation. He is a husband, a father, an artist, a traditional healer, a counselor, and a teacher. And he's in his spare time, he does this. <laughs> so today we are honored to have Miguel Flores with us to conduct this traditional blessing. Miguel. Losem Chanyovo, Ketchamalia, Kokstash, Buenos Dias, good morning. You do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Again, my name is Miguel Flores Jr. I am a member of the Pasquayaki tribe at the Nation. My parents are the late Miguel D. Flores Sr., Rosalia Mendoza Flores. My maternal grandparents are the late Juan Mendoza, Mira Mendoza from the old Pasquayaki community. My paternal grandparents are the late Felix Flores from the Vado Libre Yaki community. And Defina Ortega Flores from uh, San Javier District, the Mato Nation. These are my relations. And again, it's an honor to be here this morning to offer this prayer to start us off in a good way to be able to also acknowledge those um, ancestors that are missing, those ancestors that have been lost or from, you know, unfortunately, these things that have happened within our, our communities. So with the permission, I'd like to offer this um, short prayer. I'm not going to burn that much medicine, and I'm not sure how the sprinkler systems are in here, so I'm going to burn a little bit because I don't want to make it rain. So that's another show for a different day, but um, allow me to offer this short blessing. We come to some manner honor you, sacred smoke, Father. We thank you for this new day of life, which is blessed upon us, Father. We thank you for the morning trophy, the morning star, and Father, that brings us light, that gives us warmth. We thank you for that sacred fire inside our hearts, Father. We thank you for these relatives that are gathered here, here, here today, Grandfather. We come to some manner honor you, the sacred smoke, and bless them. The south. Senorito Macha Ataka. We come in some manner on you, sick of smoke, Father, thank the elements of the south, my Father. We thank you for the warm rains which are being away, your Father. For the rains that bring life, the rains that bring growth, the rains that kindness and heal us. We thank you for our inner peace, our inner calmness, our inner charge, your Father. We come in some manner on you, sick of smoke, bless them, to the peace of The West. Senorito Macha Ataka. We come to some manner on you, sick of smoke, Father, thank the elements of the West, your Father. We thank you for those ancestors that have left us this way of life, our Father. We ask for their guidance, their strength, their wisdom, their courage. We thank you for Mother Moon, our Father. We come to some manner on you, sick of smoke, we'll send you to the 
We come to some manner on you, sick and small, Father, thank God, much of the Lord, and Father. We thank you for the cold winds which bring you away. We thank you for the white snows, and Father. We thank you for their endurance which I teach, and Father. We thank you for the lessons of life and death which I teach, but there's death as you birth. We ask it to help us spiritually, physically, and mentally. To take away any impurities, any toughness of that that might lie within us. We ask it to bless the top of our head, the bottom of our feet, to have good strong minds, good strong hearts, and Father. We ask prayers for those relatives that are missing, God Father, that their spirits rest. For those people that are grieving, that you lay in their hearts, God Father. We ask prayers for all people and all nations that are need our prayers at this time, God Father. We come to some manner honoring the sick as well. Bless them. We can turn around this way again. take this time to moment of silence to honor those relatives that are no longer with us, that have been lost, whose spirits have passed on, passed on to the other side, and also for those spirits that haven't been found yet, that their spirit gets some rest, that those loved ones that are missing their relatives in that way too, that it brings them comfort. So that too. Blow the spirit whistle to acknowledge those, those relatives that are still out there. Pues señores, con eso, con eso, con las gracias, ese favor que pidieron, esa santa bendición. Pues aquí esperamos damos las gracias al Señor, la Virgen María, la Ángel de la Guardia, todos los que te han portado este, este día. Pidemos al Señor que le da santas bendiciones a cada uno de ustedes y, y a sus familias. Y por eso, Santa, por, por eso, um, animado junto también, que se descansen en paz. Pues así es el trabajo que lo pasaron los mayores, con, como dicen los mayores, ya que no estamos haciendo el trabajo, el trabajo como ellos lo trabajaron. Años pasados, pero aquí estamos con esa misma fe, con esa misma cebas en el corazón para seguirles adelante. Pues así, en señores, con eso, una o dos palabras, lo vamos a dejar en manos de Dios y los en Chocotecia, Sapo. Translation. Um, again, we, thank, we give thanks again to the Creator for giving us this day, day of life, this restart, the new, this new, new beginning, this way of life that our ancestors have given us since time immemorial. We may not be doing it the same way our ancestors did it many years ago, but we still do it the best way we know how, with that same heart, that same devotion. We ask blessings for every single one of you and your families to keep you strong and safe. We ask prayers for those spirits that haven't been found yet, that these prayers help them to get to wherever they, they need to get to, to bring them peace and put them in comfort. And with this, one or two or three words, we live in Creator's hands and in God's hands, and we thank you once again. So let's some chocotesia. Sapo, thank you. Please have a seat. Thank you for being here today. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson, I would like to thank you for being here. I would also like to uh, recognize all of our sponsors. I also want to announce that I neglected to mention Kristen Engel, who's also present. So welcome, Kristen Engel. We respectfully acknowledge that the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson is on land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Tono Odom and the Pasquayaki people. We also humbly acknowledge that for most of its history, our organization has not been welcoming to women of color. To quote our CEO of the League of Women Voters, US, Virginia Casey Solomon, even during the civil rights movement, the League was not as present as we should have been. While activists risked life and limb to register black voters in the South, the League's work and our leaders were late in joining to help protect all voters at the polls. It wasn't until 1966 
that we reached our first position to combat discrimination. Still, our focus on the social policy was, was from afar, not on the front lines, and African Americans were shut out of the visions of the league. Today we move forward, and we try to bring in all groups and focus on issues. Today's Issues and Eggs is important for many reasons. It helps to shed light on an issue that all too often we ignore, we avoid, or is not publicized. I want to give you a quote. Years ago, I had the opportunity to meet Wilma Mankiller. I met her here in Tucson, Arizona. I also met her in Ithaca, New York. And one of her famous quotes that I think that sums up the purpose of us moving forward states, cows run away from the storm while the buffalo charges toward it and gets through it quicker. Whenever, I, whenever I'm confronted with a tough challenge, I do not prolong the torment. I become the buffalo. Likewise, moving forward and shining a light on murdered, missing, and indigenous peoples, it's critical that we move forward as the buffalo and confront this issue that all too often folks find too uncomfortable to address. Thank you for being here today. Your presence is important. And more importantly, for you to continue shedding the light on this issue with others you come in contact with. I also want to acknowledge uh, folks who uh, indicated they would be attending. From the office of the mayor, office of the mayor Romero, Manisha, or what, Bitwa, Kim Chandler, representing Supervisor Rex Scott, Dr. Feline Cordova, the U of A College of Public Health, Jack Holland Craig, town of Marana Councilman, Amana Frias, Paskiyaki Tribal Council, Constance Hargrove, Department of Elections, David Higara, representing Supervisor Matt Hines, Jamista Pachel, former state senator, uh, Department of Interior, May uh, Piscai, state representative, Stephanie Stahl Hamilton, state representative, Kyle Walzak, representing Supervisor Matt Hines, Magdalena Verdugo of the YWCA. So thank you for participating. And Christina Andrews um, could not be here today, but we do appreciate her being able to uh, be, to want to be here, but because of illness cannot attend. Now I'd like to move on and introduce our moderator for today. I'm going to have to use my uh, phone to bring up the information. <laughs> we're, bestowed, we're, we're bestowed with the honor of having Judge Victoria Steele present today. Judge Victoria Steele, a distinguished individual of Seneca, Mingo and German heritage embodies a lifelong commitment to the social justice and healing. Born and raised in Pennsylvania, she made Tucson her home in 1978. Armed with a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in counseling, specializing in substance abuse, domestic violence, and multicultural counseling, Judge Steele has dedicated her career to making a positive impact on the lives of others. Early in her career, Judge Steele played a pivotal role in establishing the Native Ways program at The Haven a groundbreaking substance abuse, yes, a, a substance use treatment initiative tailored for indigenous women. This experience laid the foundation for her advocacy for underrepresented communities. In 2012, Judge Steele entered the realm of politics, securing her first election as a state representative and later ascending to the position of state senator. As a member of, of the Senate Minority Caucus leadership team and the National Caucus of Native American State Legislators, she left an indelible mark on Arizona legislative landscape. Her efforts were instrumental in the passage of crucial laws addressing mental health, domestic violence, orders of protection, sexual assault, and the missing and murdered indigenous persons crisis. In 2022, Judge Steele transitioned to a new chapter 
in her journey for social justice, earning the title of Justice of the Peace for Pima County Precinct 1. Her election to this esteemed position underscores her unwavering commitment to, the, to upholding justice and fostering healing and within her community. Beyond the courtroom, Judge Steele finds joy in the warmth of her family, including her cherished son, Nicholas, her loyal canine companion, Chelsea, and her supportive parents. While her schedule may be demanding, she makes time for personal passions, including indulging in the soothing sounds of jazz, immersing herself in mystery novels, and rejuvenating through long walks. In the midst of her demanding professional responsibility, Judge Victoria Steele remains a beacon of compassion, integrity, and dedication to creating a more just and equitable society. Thank you, Judge Steele, for being here today. We appreciate you, and we are honored to have you present. Without further ado, Judge Victoria Steele. Now, Eskino. So you're seeing a lot of red dresses around today, a lot of red on the tables and, and these handprints. That's not a coincidence. <laughs> um, the color red is used to call attention to those who are invisible, the missing, the murdered. Red Dress Day was inspired in 2010 by Jamie Black, a mestice artist from Manitoba, Canada. Jamie hung hundreds of empty red dresses in public places and in parks to raise awareness of missing and murdered Indigenous people. Some feel that the red dresses are used to call the spirits of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls back to their loved ones. The purpose is to speak to the gendered and racialized nature of the violent crimes against Indigenous women and girls. The bloody red handprint often seen painted across the mouth. It's a symbol used to indicate solidarity with missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, drawing attention to the fact that Native American women are 10 times more likely to be murdered or sexually assaulted. 10 times. The red handprint stands for all of our missing sisters whose voices are not heard. It also signifies the silence of the media and law enforcement in the midst of this worsening crisis. When we first started working on this issue, we knew it as missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. But once we had our first state-sponsored study committee, we discovered an alarming and disproportionately high number of indigenous boys and men north of I-40, that's that east to west highway just north of Sedona, it was then we knew that we had to broaden our scope to include all indigenous peoples. So now the, the um, effort, this movement, is known as MMIP, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples. So now, now it is time for me to introduce you to our amazing panelists. Our first panelist, April Ignacio, unfortunately had an emergency with her family today. She cannot join us, but she sent us the red dresses that you see in the back as she does these displays throughout the region. April Ignacio is Tahona O'atham. She is the mother of six. <laughs> that's, that's pretty impressive in itself. But not only that, she is a student at the U of A. She works for tribal housing. She is the co-founder of the civic engagement group Invisible Tohono. And last year, just in case she had any free time available, <laughs> she was appointed to serve on the governor's task force on missing and murdered indigenous people. Let's wish April and her family well as 
we show this video that she has given to us that she created for today's presentation.
thank you, April Ignacio. Thank you. A few years ago, when I got elected to the state senate, I was approached by a former state representative, and she asked if I would introduce legislation involving a crisis surrounding Native American women and girls. I agreed, and I joined with another state representative, Jennifer Germain, and together we created a committee to examine the high number of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. The woman behind the MMIP legislation is none other than former Senator Winona Benali Baldenegro. She is a member of the Navajo Nation and currently the Assistant Attorney General for Pasquayaki Tribe. Winona holds a Juris Doctorate from Harvard Law School and she is here today to tell us why she brought this legislation forward. Winona. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Victoria. And uh, thank you for in inviting me here. Um, I actually was a former state representative. I never got the chance to run for Senate, uh, but my former colleague, um, Senator Peshlikai, who served with me um, in what was known as Legislative District 7 is also here. So she was our senator at the time and was also part of this effort to uh, get this legislation passed. Uh, again, I'm Winona Benali Baldenegro, member of the Navajo Nation, served in the Arizona legislature. Um, you know, I was asked to talk, you know, very briefly about those early efforts to get this legislation introduced and really just get this initiative moving, at least here in Arizona. You know, the epidemic, the, the, uh, the plight of indigenous people everywhere, missing and murdered indigenous people, it was nationwide. It, it, it had gone on, it started in Canada, had made its way to the United States. And even long before that, this was also an issue um, across the border, right? We've had a lot of missing and murdered um, folks, women, the LGBT community down in, in Mexico. It's been an epidemic for many, many decades as well. So, you know, this is a sort of a, this transcends borders. Um, when I brought what was the initial draft of the legislation, which would later become HB 2570. I had met with a, a number of other uh, native state legislators across the country who had already brought legislation in their states. And we had come together to figure out, okay, let's make this a national movement how do we start introducing bills within our state, our own state legislative bodies? And so I worked together with those folks, and I want to credit them as well because you know it, it, this really was, and it had to be a national movement um, for this, for us to all be where we are today. There was also initiatives that were happening at the federal level. You know, we had BAWA going on, the reauthorization at the time, the push that was happening there. Um, we now have Savannah's Act um, on the federal level. So it's just, there was always an ongoing movement. Um, and I just did what I could, um, sort of said, here I am. What, what can I do to do my part to get this going in the state? You know, I never have hardly ever talked about my, my own personal story in all of this, I've always talked publicly about, you know, the passage of this bill, what it took to get it through the legislature, you know, and I uh, want to thank Victoria Steele and Jennifer Germain for uh, not even hesitating to bring this bill. I had decided I wasn't going to run again, so I decided to hand the bill off to them, and they did a phenomenal job. They got this l bill through the Republican legislature, unanimous votes, and got it to the best of the government. So thank you. 
Thank you to the both of them for that. Um, I'm going to eventually turn my time to you know, Fred and the folks who are sitting on the, the now created task force because what they have to say is really important and you know, they're going to give us a rundown of where they're at. But I, what I wanted to share um, about my own personal story, you know, part of why I also brought this bill is because early on, we'd always talked about the numbers, right? Everybody had always heard about the statistics about indigenous, you know, women, um, LGBTQ, our, our gender diverse relatives are more likely to experience um, sexual violence. You know, we always heard the numbers all the time, four out of five indigenous women. Well, I became one of those statistics. And I became a victim right before I was sworn in, literally a couple of months before I was sworn into the legislature. Never in my life did I think and I had hoped I would never become one of those statistics, but I knew those numbers did not lie. You know, and I, when I had run for the legislature, part of my stump speech was, you know, I would cite the fact that at the time, the imaginary boundary between our reservation, off our exterior boundaries of our reservation, I, those of us who are indigenous, literally we cross, we could walk across the line and the statistics jump up for, for the risk that we were at, we were in to become, you know, to, to fall victim. And I said, that's, you know, unacceptable. The, those numbers can't be that high. They should not be that high. Um, I was um, sexually assaulted on um, a reservation that was not my own. And with that came this jurisdictional maze, this matrix that exists nowhere else in the law. You know, when a tribal prosecutor, a federal prosecutor takes one of these cases, they literally have to go through this checklist, this like I said, this matrix of, okay, is the victim an, an Indian? Is the victim a tribal member? What about the perpetrator? Are they Indian? Are you they not Indian? Can you imagine having to ask those questions nowadays that our criminal justice system is such that you have to ask the racial background of the victim and the perpetrator? You know, at the time, there was a... Um, this was pre-authorization uh, before the VAWA was reauthorized in 2020, I think it was, in which there were a set of crimes by which you could bring um, file charges for sexual violence. And at that time, the federal pros I mean, sorry, the tribal prosecutor who had taken on my case um, is something I'll never forget. You know, she was a, a female a tribal member herself, had come to me and was so disheartened because she had to break the news to me and tell me that because of um, my status as a non-tribal member there and the status of the, the perpetrator and where it happened and the type of crime that was committed, we don't have a crime on the books which we could charge. The most that we could charge in your case is assault and battery. That's a jurisdictional void that existed at the time. And so you can imagine with all these cases that we have, all these people who have gone missing and murdered, none of them, the vast majority of them never received justice at all. I like to think that, and I credit the people who are involved in my case, uh, for one, I, mean, I don't know if this is something that sort of still might be unheard of, but I was very fortunate that I had um, the tribal prosecutor in my case was a woman. The attorneys general for both tribes were women, and the judge was a woman. They figured out how they could stack the charges such that they were able to put away my perpetrator for a year in tribal jail. 
It took that entire system, those individuals that come together to figure out how to get me justice. But you know what? That doesn't happen all the time. It should, but it doesn't. And so that's one of the reasons why I decided, look, I mean, if I've experienced this in the criminal justice system, can you imagine all the other folks out there who are victims of sexual violence, sexual assault, rape? I don't think they got, certainly, I don't believe they got the justice that I got. And that's just, that's just absolutely unacceptable. And so I, you know, fast forward to today, um, a lot has changed, a lot has improved. VAWA was reauthorized. Um, I, I'm getting all my dates mixed up because I haven't been in office in a while. I don't remember if that was under the Obama administration. Um, and so today, sexual violence, the categories have been broadened, so they now capture those crimes. Um, we have a lot more focused and hopefully more resources that are going into helping our gender diverse relatives as well, our two-spirit, because they certainly also um, have experienced rates um, higher at times than uh, those of us who identify as indigenous women. And, you know, I want, I want to wrap up what I have to say uh, uh, with regard to, you know, yes, we have so much resource. A lot of elected officials are putting their time and their effort and their attention into this. But it's still happening, right? We still get those national cases. Just two weeks ago, we had Nex Benedict. How many of you have heard of heard Nex Benedict's name in the, in the media? Nex Benedict. Um, I'm actually just gonna because I don't I don't want to get the details wrong. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of. Uh, been following the news. Um, you know, next Benedict, I believe next Benedict was, uh, her, their mother was uh, a member, of, is a member of the Takja Nation. So um, next Benedict lost their life. Um, next was 16 years old. A uh, student in um, Oklahoma who died because they were beaten to death. We now count next Benedict as, as part of our lost relatives. I, I can't begin to tell you, you know, you sort of, we take two steps forward and then sometimes we feel like we take two steps right back and, and here we are again, um, having to mourn the loss of someone in our community, part of our larger indigenous family, um, over such a horrible, tragic loss. So this continues to happen today. And um, I was just sharing with uh, my colleague and, and my boss, Fred Urbina here. There was a um, study that just came out again, like a couple of weeks ago by Brookings and given uh, the fact that we're the League of Women Voters here, uh, the group here, centering on the elections. Brookings Institute just released a study that said missing and murdered women is the top issue fa facing Native American communities heading in the 2024 elections. So for folks who are doing, you know, outreach out there, talking to folks about the upcoming election season, right? This is an issue that's still very important to us. Um, it's an issue that, you know, we talk about getting folks to the polls. We got to meet, we got to meet indigenous voters halfway, right? We, we've got to start caring about our issues. We've got to start paying attention to what's going on. Um, and just continue to uplift our voices and, and help us champion these issues.
and talk to your elected officials, right? Have them commit additional resources to our communities so that we can continue to combat, um, bring down the statistics. So thank you for your time, appreciate it. Thank you, Winona. Our next panelist joins us via Zoom from Northern Arizona because her job has her traveling all over the state of Arizona to lead this effort to address this problem. Last year, Governor Katie Hobbs announced the creation of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples Task Force, and she promptly named Hopi tribal member Valora Imus Nashanhoya as MMIP coordinator for the governor's office. Valora is director and founder of Hungzwangzi, a missing persons and trafficking recovery program. She has a bachelor's in health promotion and a master's in criminal justice. Valora worked with ASU's research program on violent victimization, and she was a victim specialist with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Valora joins us today remotely from Hopi land to tell us about the work of MMIP Task Force. Valora. Thank you, um, Victoria. Good morning, everybody. I'm so very sorry I can't be there with you all in person. Um, many of us live what we consider two worlds and um, having to be here in Hopi for some of our cultural duties as well. Um, so it, it's been amazing here in Hopi, but I certainly miss... Um, being in the valley as well. Uh, so just some things we have to learn to live with. Um, so I, I wanna thank you again for having me today and, and sharing a little bit more about, you know, what we've been doing around MMIW, G, and P. Um, but it was great to hear um, Winona speak this morning. Um, Winona is, the individual who brought me into this work. Um, I totally value her insights in terms of how this movement has begun in Arizona. Um, and, you know, thank you, uh, Winona, again, you know, I, I love you all and the work that we've all done previously to where we are today. So what I wanna start off with today is um, um, <clears throat> coming into this movement, um, what I recognized in the advocacy that was happening at the state uh, was that the actual victim advocacy experiences were not in were not part of the um, stories that were happening. Um, meaning, what was the responses of our our victims and our families who were faced by these strategies um, and I was very fortunate to be able to share how much of this jurisdictional maze that we speak of was reality, how much of the non-responses of our law enforcement was reality, and the services that our families and victims, survivors, were not receiving and bringing that to light in terms of their true experiences. Um, it was really interesting, um, you know, and, and I remember the day we waited over eight hours to be heard um, at the state as we moved this bill. But that was an experience to really show me in terms of as a grassroots advocate, as a system-based advocate, that we need to be able to prepare our families and survivors to be able to share their testimony. Um, that was a lot of the work that I did. Um, as our HB 2570 was passed, I elected not to be a committee member because I knew that I wouldn't be able to do the work that I was that I did during that time, which was being side by side with Victoria, being side by side with 
uh, former Re Representative Jermaine in terms of what does this, what is this work going to look like and how can we bring out these stories? Um, and a lot of our work, you know, was as a result of um, not only Representative Jermaine, but others who brought in ASU research on violent victimization to be able to ethically and um, gather stories um, of our indigenous people. So on your tables, um, uh, Sherry has printed you guys some information there. And I just want to briefly go over that a little bit. Um, so the first one is the one titled um, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, The Crisis in Arizona. This is a summary of our report um, that we pulled out. Again, it was a collaboration of survivors who shared with us um, what they wanted the public to know about the research that we did around MMIWG. The most significant one was, you know, they wanted us to know what is MMIWG. Um, we also wanted to know why was it happening? Um, and it this was a lot of education that was had to have happened with some of our survivors as we did this research. And um, I'm gonna share you a little summary as well in terms of, you know, the the one-on-one um, -on -one conversations that I had with many of our survivors and our families around this issue. Um, and through education of our survivors and their families, we talk about colonization, genocide, cultural assimilation, systemic racism. Many of us who experienced this type of violence necessarily didn't think of it as this, in this manner. Um, but as we began to learn about it and the experiences that they had with their perpetrators, this is what they were actually experiencing. Um, at the end, it was taking their life. That was the fear. Um, so, you know, this, again, it's very interesting to, to do be part of education, but, uh, and again, to see the responses of our families and our survivors. Um, during this research, we also identified that this issue happens to everybody from infant to elder. Um, we also recognize that those who commit these type of incidents, we found that many of them did not know who they were. Um, but the next one, which was very close to that, was our own intimate partners, um, people that we knew um, and surprisingly, strangers were were uh, released. Um, one of the significant things that we also recognized in this study, as a summary, is that we wanted to know, you know, how many were murdered. Um, a lot of research and data is all as we know, um, but from 1976 to 2018 we only found 160 indigenous women and girls that were known to be murdered in Arizona. So what does this tell us? Um, you know, the first thought for many is, is it being reported? Is it being investigated? Um, our families, are they in fear? You know, all of these questions came about. Um, the graph just really shows you, you know, how often does it happen? Um, we've seen it, We've seen a spike in 2017, um, and you know we we recognize some of these spikes happening, and really thinking back as to what was going around happening around this time. Um, but we also wanted our survivors and families to tell us how do we take some action, um, and we really wanted to bring awareness to the community, to our families. Um, we wanted to also ask more questions to our elders, our leaders, um, but and also supporting our indigenous organization. Most importantly, the biggest message was if you see something, say something. So these were some significant summaries as a result of the coordination and collaboration with some of our uh, families and survivors. 
The next one that I want to talk a little bit about is, um, I think on your table as well, our most recent research that was done um, with ASU Rove is we wanted to know, because during some of our interviews that we conducted um, in our first research, we were recognizing that the family survivors who were sharing their stories, um, their children were in college. Um, and they really express how the, the experiences, the trauma had an effect on their educational goals. So we did another study on um, college students. Um, our, our initial plan was to do our tri-university um, as, as our participants. Um, that did not work out, so we stuck to ASU. And in that information, you'll see some um, percentages in terms of what our college students, is, college students were experiencing. Um, and our highest one was, you know, was our interpersonal violences that were that they were experiencing. Uh, Seventy-five percent had personal MMIP experiences, um, which meant meant it was their own family that were the victims or the survivor that experienced missing and or murdered. So you know, definitely these had a lot of. Um, um, trauma associated with them, um, and but also the the acknowledgement of their own victimization from domestic violence to sexual assault happening while they were in um, college, and so you know it it's very interesting to see you know how we're able to identify again, our historical trauma that's occurring and, and carrying us throughout life. And although we want to do great in life, such as go to college, getting work experiences, you know, there's always this black cloud over us. Um, and I use the black cloud because this is how survivors explain it. They explain it like there's this black cloud over them that they just can't move away from because in their mind, they're thinking about these experiences of not only their own experiences, but their family experiences. Um, the trauma of having to go look for a loved one, the trauma of having to, to identify their loved one or their families identifying their loved ones and the stories that they bring back to their own families to explain what they actually saw is very traumatic to our young adults who are just beginning to lead into this world of, of being young adults, of taking some independence for themselves. Um, so, you know, this is where many of our um, stories are coming from. Um, our, our another research that we did is we were, I was, the person who interviewed 37 individuals during COVID time. Our intent was to go to every reservation and interview, give an opportunity for families and survivors to share their stories around missing and murdered. Um, COVID happened, um, tribal um, tribes were being shut down to COVID and, and we continued, we, we continued this research. We wanted to hear from our families and survivors um, and our only capability was virtually. Um, so we did this through Zoom, we did this through Facebook, um, Messenger video because on reservation, sometimes that was the only virtual option that they had. So we certainly accommodate many of our families and survivors. Um, in, in talking to families and survivors, we identified um, six individual females um, whose family shared their story of their loved one being murdered, um, five females that were missing, 10 that were missing and murdered, and um, female survivors 
who shared their story that were missing um, and survived those ordeals. With our males, we interviewed families um, with two males that were murdered, one that was missing, and five that were missing and murdered. Um, although this was really based on our um, families and survivors and their experiences, we also honored and and to listen to transgender survivors. And these two were missing um, survivors and their stories were very um, eye-opening to us in terms of you know, their own experiences. Mm -hmm. In this study also with the Croy and Milligan, we did also interview our victim advocates. We interviewed our law enforcement because oftentimes the stories is, is um, the reality of our law enforcement being blamed for not responding, right? Um, but we wanted to know from law enforcement you know, what, what is happening within your organizations and departments that our families and survivors feel like there's a lack of response? Well, as a summary, um, we did interview state, county, city, university, and tribal police in this study. And the outcome of this as to why um, the lack of response goes back to staffing and the availability of a department to be able to staff 24-7 um, and, and the responses that they had, um, funding, um, training, you know, um, was the top three. Um, and, I mean, I get it. I worked in, in, in our judicial agencies, um, but at the same time, you know, is I, I really personally feel like we need to do better. Um, and I feel this because it's our families and survivors, you know, who are experiencing these um, strategies at the moment and they need that response. Um, so, you know, this was our, our studies. Um, and the last one we did was with victim compensation, our state victim compensation. Um, we did find that many of our families and survivors who were indigenous did not apply for the opportunities to be reimbursed through victim compensation um, for for the main reason of the not understanding the application, um, not understanding the information that was being asked of them to provide. Um, we also did not have the um our counselors our traditional counselors our traditional healers are not licensed um and we were unable to be in re reimbursed for their services um our funeral expenses our traditional funeral expenses um were not able to be reimbursed through this compensation so you know we worked really hard at at um, advocating to victim comp and over the years they've made some amendments in their approval processes to help indigenous people especially those that live on reservation land um, and I'm really proud that through um, and I'm, I'm going ahead a little bit because I'm really proud of this one um, is that through our current MMIP task force there's some things that we've carried over through the recommendations of HB 2570. One of them is we are going to be um, doing some education on reservation land um, or close to reservations that they can come to um, to educate our advocates, law enforcement, our social workers, our community, our families and survivors on how to apply for victim compensation. How do we document the required um, documents that need to be submitted? And if law enforcement is unable to give them a, a re official report, how can our advocates assist in getting those reports or doing a, a, 
a supporting document that victim compensation can be able to um, accept as justification of a police report. So I'm really proud of that. That will be happening um, later this year and, and through next year. Um, so we are moving efforts in, in terms of not only our current task force, but our previous task um, listening task force. So what are we doing now? Um, as, as Victoria had mentioned, Governor Katie Hobbs um, has created our MMIP task force um, in her office. And I'm very honored to be the, the coordinator for this task force. Um, this work is my passion. This work is something that I've been doing since the onset of my career over 20 years. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I become a little bit stronger in terms of my own voice. Um, I think um, Honorable Urbina will, will testify to this. I used to be this, this shy girl that does things, you know, what I need to do, but silently. But I feel like I've, my voice has become stronger in terms of ensuring that our advocacy piece are being addressed. And I'm speaking at this higher level um, to support our families and survivors. So through that and through this governor's task force, she has given us nine executive order charges. Um, I saw these executive order charges and I'm like, holy moly, how are we going to address all of this um, within our term? Our term started last year and ends in 2026. Um, she definitely has challenged us. Um, and, and I hope that I know I, I am and our task force members um, are definitely also challenged and willing to accept this challenge in working through these executive orders. Through these executive orders, um, there was no better way than to create working groups. Um, we have a health working group that's addressing the um, practices of licensed and unlicensed private and public rehabilitation and sober living homes. They're also addressing the um, to understand a little bit further about our lived experiences around MMIP. Uh, we also have our judicial working group. They've been tasked three executive order charges. One of them is to look into our prosecutorial trends and practices, um, to look into working with law enforcement and our tribal government in terms of how do we better track and collect data around MMIP, and also working with our Attorney General's office um, to be able to formulate some effective programs, which include some funding sources. Our, our next um, group is our policy working group. Um, they're tasked to um, collaborate with our state, federal, and tribal agencies to be able to come up with some recommendations um, that not will come up with and but also looking at our previous recommendations and what are some of those things that we can be able to pull up and aggressively look into but also proactively moving this forward and asking governor to look at these recommendations a little bit further. These take certainly um, some additional time and research, um, not only in our legal research, but what is currently um, in legislative, um, um, not practices, but what are our legislators also looking at um, so that we don't, that we can complement it and support it, or we create a new one. Um, the next one is to review policies and practices um, of our child welfare policies. Um, and, uh, and lastly, our tribal working group is that they're currently working on having a consultation with our tribal, tribal um, leadership, but also our families and survivors um, around MMIP 
but also looking into our uh, victim services in terms of our cultural identities and increasing our cultural competencies, not only in tribal lands, but also within our urban populations with nonprofit, for-profit organizations that, that many of our families and survivors seek services. I want to thank you for the amazing amount of work that you're doing and just hearing everything that you're telling us today about all of the pieces of this work. It, it is almost overwhelming hearing it all. Thank you so much. For your work. Thank you. Now, because this situation had been allowed to fester for so long in the shadows, it has reached a point of urgency. The missing and murdered indigenous people's crisis is one of social injustice, a crisis of public safety, and an issue of civil rights. That brings us to our final presenter today, Alfred Urbina. Alfred is an attorney general for the Pasquayaki tribe and a member of the governor's Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples Task Force. He joins us today to talk about the urgency of this work, what the task force has shown us, and what lies ahead. Alfred. Thank you, Judge, and I know you'll keep me on task. <laughs> <laughs> um, Often, often people ask, and, and part of what we're trying to do is, is answer the question, right, why, why is this happening? And there's a lot of different issues that are rooted in, in why this is happening. But maybe the proper question is, why wouldn't this be happening? Um, if April Ignacio was here today, she would say that the answer to that question is men. Um, you know, and, and, and that's true. In the, in the vast majority of these cases, it's men. Um, as a male myself, um, I was raised in a household where I watched my mother beaten by my father. And he taught me that this is the way men should be. Um, imagine, imagine seeing that as a, as a young boy um, and, and growing up and, and understanding and, and seeing violence in your household. Um, so so that, that's the primary reason. Some other legal reasons and, and issues that um, we deal with that the task force deals with are important. Um, we did a land, a land acknowledgement earlier. And it's ironic that we do that now, but, but it's also um, the historical tentacles that tie this issue to where we're at today. Um, imagine being here 100 plus years ago and, and, and say someone came into this room and said, hey, you're all here, you're all members of this family, but we're gonna ask you to move away from the choice land that is Tucson, Arizona. Um, you know, we sit between the San Pedro and the Santa Cruz, um, but 150 years ago, after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the Gadsden Purchase, um, there, was, there was efforts to move tribal people, indigenous people, north, south, east, and west to reservations. Um, these reservations were not meant to build thriving communities. Um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was the Department of War, and those reservations were meant to keep people where they currently are um, with minimal resources away from their traditional homelands away from life-giving water and food. Um, when we think about Arizona, 
a lot of people civically think about the five C's, right? Copper, cattle, climate. But we, we forgot about the culture that was here. And we left that out. Um, and so what we're dealing with now is a product of these things. And if you look around Tucson, you'll, you'll see Fort Lowell Park. You might take your kids there. Um, and you might take, you know, play soccer. But that place, and we can add the Presidio de Tucson. We can add Tubac. Um, Sierra Vista. You know, these are all um, historical pieces that helped basically create this current problem. Um, we think about the birth of Tucson and um, a lot of the things that have happened historically, the railroad. Um, these are all things that couldn't happen without moving tribal people away from this area. Um, in 1885, the US government, Congress created the Major Crimes Act, and that was meant to address violent crime on reservations. Um, in 1978, the U.S. Supreme Court um, heard a case called Oliphant v. Suquamish. That case says that tribal governments do not have jurisdiction over non-Indians. And so uh, imagine, imagine living here today and, and knowing that um, if, if you were victimized, if you were sexually assaulted, if your children were murdered, um, that there wasn't a, a remedy, that there wasn't justice. Um, often in our day-to-day -day lives, we, we take safety for granted. You know, we, we go about our daily lives and we're not really concerned too much. We know that if there is a crime, that law enforcement will show up, there'll be a trial or something, and there'll be some sort of justice. Um, that's just not happening because of the legal structures that exist on reservations, the lack of resources. And when you don't have that safety, when you don't have the, um, the capacity to bring justice, then you start to see these social problems that arise on reservations. Um, the public health connection that we see today with diabetes and alcoholism and addiction. Um, if you were in that situation for decades, what were your families look like? What, were, what would your communities and neighborhoods look like? How would you protect yourself? As a former prosecutor, I've, I've been in the position of talking to families and explaining to them that your daughter was sexually assaulted, your justice will be one year in tribal jail for that perpetrator. And that was a tribal, a native perpetrator. And imagine the anger that you would feel in that situation um, when there was no justice for um, your family member. Things have changed. There have been, um, like Winona mentioned, there have been um, state legislation that has, that's pushing us forward with the task force. Um, the work that you do here is critical because when you work as an organization to, to, um, to, to bring forward leaders that will help address this issue, um, I can remember when the Violence Against Women Act was, was reauthorized um, during the Obama administration. That gave us the ability to prosecute non-Indian offenders. Um, our tribe was the first in the nation to prosecute a non-Indian offender of domestic violence um, since 1978. Since that time, we've had hundreds of cases on our small reservation on the on Bosco Yaki lands southwest of here. Hundreds of cases of, the, of violence against Native women primarily. Um, these are non-Indian offenders, um, Caucasian, Asian, Hispanic, um, who are perpetrating these crimes. Uh, so we have evidence that this is happening. We have evidence that um, 
that we can provide to Congress on the gaps in jurisdiction. Um, it's still limited in terms of what we can do. Our authority under the Tribal Law and Order Act is limited to three years. So if someone commits a homicide or a sexual assault, that tribal felony crime is limited to a three-year term in tribal jail. So we still, we still work with our federal partners to try to address this in federal court. However, here in Arizona, um, it's difficult because the federal system um, is, is a system that is bogged down with immigration cases. Um, we, we lack judges. We lack U.S. attorneys and FBI agents who can go out and investigate crimes and also prosecute these crimes in federal court. The dockets there are backed up. Um, there is difficulty getting out to um, reservations in far places like the Navajo Nation, the Tohonotham Nation, and even the Paspoyaki tribe. And so um, the authority that we have to address this issue, um, I connect back to what you are doing as an organization. Um, because we're on the ground implementing the laws that are passed by representatives that you help elect to office. So it's critical, it's very important. The work that you're doing today will help us in the future as we address this crisis. Um, and I wanna thank you for the work you do. I wanna thank you for um, being here today and listening. Um, Valora mentioned that I can testify to um, who she was um, a few years ago. We were working in Phoenix in, in an organization called the BIA. That stands for Boston Indians Around. <laughs> and and uh, she was a victim advocate, right? She directly represented the families in federal court. And um, she also, her organization helps with human trafficking. So she rescues women have, who have been human trafficked. Um, and she did so during the, the recent Super Bowl in Phoenix. Um, now she's on the ninth floor with Governor Hobbs leading these efforts um, in Arizona, war working. Um, I'm confident that we will be able to address this problem um, with the people that we have, with colleagues and leaders that will support tribes and support these issues. Um, I know, I know it, it's about time to wrap up, but these issues are, are critical. Um, we're working with the city of Tucson, um, Pima County. There's a, there's a local task force here um, that will help us connect with the, with the county coroner, and, and we'll be able to do things locally to help address these problems. People move back and forth from the reservation. I mentioned the lack of resources. There's a lack of housing. And so people move back and forth. Um, and so when, when that happens, uh, when there's a lack of housing, when there's a lack of resources, um, there's homicides that occur in Pima County, in Maricopa County, and Coconino County that are tied to these historical problems that exist on reservations. So. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Victoria Steele, Judge Steele. Thank you all for being here today. Um, Winona, she's, she's awesome. <laughs> I'm lucky to work with her. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. And Victor, if you would join me up here for a moment and... Um, I just, I, this was kind of unexpected, and um, who's the, the, uh, the photographer that? <clears throat> it's Augustine Lopez. Okay, so um, Alfred brought this picture in today. It's the one that you've been seeing. Thank you. And um, so I thought we needed to do something with this. It can't just stay here, and it can't be on my wall in my living room, even though it's gorgeous. I, when I worked at the Haven, I started this program called Native Ways because Indigenous women were coming into a 90-day program, and they were leaving within a week. 
because they just couldn't. Yet you're asking somebody who is doing the hardest thing in the world to start recovery, and you're asking them to do it in a culture that's not theirs, and and they they could not get the healing they needed. Sometimes they might get pieces of it, but not enough. So we created this program. And then when I left the Haven to go and run for office, crazy person that I am, um, I needed someone who would follow up and keep the work going. And that someone was Nati Kano. Nati, would you please come up? So the reason that this is connected is one of the things that I learned in working in my own life, but in working in um, the substance abuse field, is that when you have somebody who has a severe addiction and is facing death, you take away the drug and that lets all of that trauma come forth. And so, so much of what we're talking about today is trauma. And so Nati has been working with women who have suffered that trauma. She is on the front lines and she is beloved and I love you and this is for you. We'll get to the Q&A in just a moment, but I did want to mention we had um, a representative from the governor or from the mayor's office of Tucson, because we do we're the first city in the country that has a citywide task force for missing and murdered, um, and so yeah, so she had to leave. Um, just a few minutes ago, but she wanted us to let you know that as soon as they have um, work back on or uh, results back on the work that they are doing, they will get that out to you so that you know what the city task force on MMIP is doing. Okay, do we have any questions for our panelists that are written down on cards? Give them to Victor or whoever's collecting them. We've got a couple here. Thank you. All right. Okay, what resources do you suggest we can learn more about for the history and issues facing indigenous peoples? Um, I'm going to give that one to Winona. Me? Yeah. Can I? Pass to the okay, we're going to pass that one. You know what? I, I think since um, Valora is back here up over my head, <laughs> that, that she might be the perfect person to ask that question of. So, Valora, what resources do you suggest that people can go to to turn to to learn more about the history and issues on this, this topic? Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, immediately on the top of my head, nationally, um, the National Indian Women's Resource Organization has a lot of information um, in relation to history. Um, in Arizona, our state coalitions, the Hopi Tewa Women's Coalition and the Southwest Indigenous Women's Coalition, um, they also work collaboratively with, with the National Indian Women's Resource Center, um, but they're here locally. Um, those are the three I would um, provide the recommendations regarding history. Okay. And this one is for Winona. Now understanding why your perpetrator only received one year if he was tried in a non-tribal court, what do you think he would have received? Okay. I'm not a criminal attorney. I don't practice criminal law. Um, Fred's a former prosecutor. He's saying, what, five years? Yeah, potentially three to five years, maybe probation also. Um, potentially 10 years, depending on, on the crimes that were. So thank you. Um, probably, probably three to five years, depending on the county, depending on 
Um, the prosecutor, depending on the charges, um, it'd probably be a multi-year plea agreement, likely. Um, there'd probably be probation as well. That person would also have to be a sex offender for life. Um, there'd probably be fines associated with that as well, but certainly uh, state prison time. Okay, the next question is what is being done with K through 12 post high school students to educate them about this MMIP issue? Valora, would you like to take that one? Yes, um, it's been a challenge. Um, um, with with Honon C Consulting, um, Brandon is our youth and men um, coordinator and the challenge that he's having is talking about this issue um, within our school districts. Um, we went through several um, public school board meetings to introduce some curriculum um, that we may be able to provide or even a, an hour presentation. Um, we've not been successful in our metro public schools, but we've been so successful in our reservation schools. Um, so we are educating our youth. Um, we actually have one, uh, he has one on Monday here in Hopi, um, but he does it as a community base as well in terms of educating um, a lot of youth in sports. Um, he's a basketball coach, but he provides a lot of education to the parents, to the athletes um, during tournament time. Um, it, it's brought so much awareness. Um, there's a lot of support with these kids. They're coming out telling stories. It gets tricky, though, because sometimes they're telling on their parents. <laughs> um, so, you know, we have to be careful, but it, it's getting there. Um, I just wish that we could do more education and awareness um, in a more structured um, atmosphere, such as our school systems. Okay, and Valora, one of our questions is, what is your contact information? How about an email? Can you share an email with the group? I'm going to share two emails. It's V-I-N-A-H-S-O-N-H-O-Y-A at az.gov. Um, but the work that does community-based, the search for missing persons, the trafficking recovery, our men and youth programs. Um, that email goes to Brandon, which is H-O-N, as in Nancy, W-U-N, as in Nancy, G-S-I-C-S, -S at gmail.com. All right. And we are running out of time. I'm only going to do a couple more. Some of these are a little repetitive. Um, what outside, what can outside nonprofit organizations do to support advocating efforts, advocacy efforts to increase funding and services for tribal communities statewide? Um, Alfred, I know that you are on the MMITP task force. Do you have any suggestions for outside advocacy groups? Yeah, here locally, the um Emerge Center is has a program and they're connected to an organization called Boys to Men and they're basically addressing the issue that we mentioned earlier about men and trying to prevent uh, violence and and basically um, so supporting Emerge in these efforts would probably help in terms of prevention um, especially here locally um, in Tucson and Pima County. Okay, and I'm going to make this the final question. What and this is for Winona, and and I don't know if I'm asking something that goes along with your work now, but what has been the involvement of the Department of Justice and our members of Congress on this issue? Oh wow! Does anybody have that, Winona? Um, uh, Valora? I, yeah, I'll let these two answer. Sorry, I'm sort of out of the loop now. Um, so I'm going to pass it to them. So the U.S. Attorney has been very active okay. in this area. We recently convened um, a meeting in Tucson with the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, 
the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and local law enforcement, as well as tribal law enforcement and tribal prosecutors to collect information of missing and murdered indigenous women and, and men and basically upload it to a federal system called MAMIS. And so they're doing that. They're also working with us to investigate and prosecute these cases um, on reservations, implement federal laws that have been passed in the past five to ten years, um, those efforts are po policy priorities by the Biden administration. Okay, so that concludes our presentation today. Victor, where are you? Come on up. <laughs> um, so speaking on behalf of all of the kind people who put this program together, there are... This room is so beautiful, and, and all of the tables, everything, they have done a tremendous job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I especially want to thank you for showing up today, for being here. You showed up out of a genuine desire to be helpful, to gain awareness, to understand and to learn more about this. And together, that helps us. That helps us enormously in finding solutions to bringing our loved ones back home, to stopping this problem, to putting the brakes on people going missing, people being abused and, and murdered. And we thank you so much for your genuine concern and interest in being here today. You showed up. I want to recognize the folks that worked on this committee. So I'm going to ask them to stand if they're present in the room. Laura Benson, Betsy Bolden, Sue DeArmond, Kathleen Edelman, Krista Hinman, Maura Raffensberg, Sherry Springer, Pat Weidolf, and Nina Willis. Nina Willis. Without them, this event would not have been possible. The past few years, we've done this um, virtual. So this is the first time in a few years that we've actually held it in person. So we were naturally going to have a few bumps in the road. But I can tell you that uh, without this committee, this program would not have been successful and would not have been productive. And it's a blessing to have worked with them. It's a blessing uh, to have learned from them. and. We hope to do, you know, future programs, you know, with the same energy and community involvement that uh, this committee engaged with. So thank you, committee members, for making this happen. You are appreciated. So thank you, everyone that uh, participated and took part. I want to make sure and thank our sponsors, the Hilton Hotel, Southwest Gas, Pima County um, Council on Aging, uh, Cox Communication, El Rio, uh, Mark Sub Sublet, Tucson Electric Power, uh, Cushman and Wakefield, The Loft Cinema, AAUW, Mark Batik Galleria, Organization of Chinese Americans, OCA. Thank you everyone that attended today. We appreciate you. We appreciate you supporting this event. Please spread the word through the community and uh, try to do additional programs that bring light or shine light on this issue. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.